human nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut You know, you might think that in order to enjoy animals, you have to be out in the wilderness. But I've got to admit, I really like zoos too. Right now I'm at the Calgary Zoo, which is a very nice zoo. And I'm sure you realize that zoos have changed in the last little while. They're no longer just menageries full of animals for people to gawk at. They're also conservation agencies working to help protect animal species that might or might not survive in the wild. And zookeepers and zoo designers, they're also concerned not just about the health of their animals, but about the happiness of their animals as well. Things like these bald eagles, they've got a great big naturalistic enclosure to fly around in. And I'm no expert on what eagles are thinking, but you look in their eyes and they seem to still have their sense of majesty. I've got a degree in zoology, by the way, and you always pronounce it zoology, not zoology, because it's not really the study of zoos, it's the study of animals. Zoo is a word that means animal. I guess that means we should pronounce it zoa as well. We're at the Calgary Zoa today. Calgary Zoa. Zoa. Practice that. Confuse your friends. Many birds of prey in zoos were injured and could not be returned to the wild. Well, you know, there's some animals that are just plain zoo classics. You couldn't think about going to the zoo without spending at least a little bit of time watching the lions. I have a lot of trouble hiding my felines about lions. So does Brian Keating. He's the head of conservation outreach here at the Calgary Zoo. Now, Brian, you've watched lions both in the zoo here and in Africa. You've got to have a real feeling for these animals. Oh, they're, they are the king of beasts. At least that's what we've been told they are. Oh, absolutely. But they're not. See, elephants really are the king of beasts. Elephants win out by sheer size. When you weigh six or seven tons, you can get anything you want, including rights to the waterhole. So elephants really are the king of beasts. Okay. But lions are the king of the predators. They're right on the top, parallel in many places with the hyenas. Very powerful animals. I'll never forget the first time I had the chance to touch a real lion. It was here at the zoo years ago. Our vets had to tranquilize our big male lion because they needed to give him a checkup and they needed to comb out his big mane, which had become unruly. So they tranquilized him, and I was lucky enough to be there. I picked up the lion's paw, and the, 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 the paw itself felt like a couple of lead pipes wrapped in hot burlap. Right away, it crystallized in my mind this image of lions being able to break the neck of a buffalo with a single swipe. They are the king of the predators. Two lead pipes wrapped in hot burlap. Boy, that's an image. Well, they're powerful animals, and you don't realize how big they are even when you're here at the zoo. When and Until they come right up to the edge of the enclosure, maybe over at the glass window, where you can put your nose right to their nose, and you see the size of their face. Their eyes are so big, they seem to look right through your eyes. They look like they're looking right through you. And in fact, many times at the zoo, I've watched family groups watch walk by the lion exhibit, and the lions immediately cue in to the babies or the little kids that are toddling along. Because of course lions are programmed to kill the weak and the easy to get. You know, they're hardwired to do that kind of killing. And that's what makes them the king of predators. So when I'm at the zoo, most of the time when I see the lions, they're just sort of lazing around. Is that pretty typical behavior for them in the wild? Lions sleep or lie around for about 23 and three quarter hours out of the day. They're professional time wasters and they do it with such style on their back, feet straight up in the air, on their side. 
they're very social, they're always touching each other, head butting, doing all of this wonderful behavior. So they do spend a lot of time lying around, but they're conserving energy. Being a top predator is hard work. When they have to go and earn their meat, they've got to put a lot of energy into it. It takes incredible energy and it's dangerous to actually go out and kill things. You could get a hoof to the jaw, to the face, you could get a broken rib. It's, it's, it's definitely a dangerous position being the top predator. So you have to enjoy them when you come to the zoo. You have to enjoy them for what they are. Just take in the fact that they're sitting there, they're lying there, they're playing there, they're just looking around. Just enjoy them for what they are, the king of the predatory beasts. So Brian, even though these lions are lying, you're not lying about lions, are you? No, I wouldn't lie to you, John. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. This thing's been extinct for many, many years. Wait a minute. These dinosaur models are getting more and more sophisticated all the time. You know, when I'm at the Calgary Zoo and I look at the dinosaur models, I think about elephants. And when I look at the elephants, I think about dinosaurs because I like thinking about big animals. And have you ever noticed that big animals, even if they're not related, they have kind of the same shape? Now ignore the tail and the head on this thing right now. Doesn't this look like an elephant body to you? And the thick pillar-like legs, the short stubby toes, the almost circular feet. All of those features go together. Biologists call them graviportal adaptations, but we just call them looking like an elephant. Of course, this Stegosaurus also has those big fins, those bony fins on the back. They were first interpreted as a defense against predators, but then paleontologists noticed that they had a lot of channels near the surface for blood vessels. They were actually also cooling fins to help this big, big body shed some heat. And you think about elephants, they've got those big ears. The ears are used to signal their mood to one another, but they're also cooling fins because elephants have trouble losing heat. They, uh, now they overheat quite easily, which is partly why they do well here in Calgary. Ah, wonderful. Oh, isn't this neat? I was saying, when I see elephants, I think about dinosaurs. I'll bet you know what I'm thinking right now. Yeah, it'd be fun to ride a dinosaur. And you know how you see pictures of dinosaurs galloping across the landscape these days? I don't think it would be like that at all. An animal as big as Kamala can't gallop at all because she's too heavy. She can't get all her feet off the ground at once. Even the two-legged dinosaurs were probably walkers and not runners. So when you see those galloping dinosaur pictures, my advice, don't believe them. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you, Kamala. This is Kamala, and Kamala is, well, she's an Asiatic elephant. I was going to say Indian elephant, but I guess you say Asiatic elephant now, don't you? Yeah. That's correct. All Indian elephants are Asian elephants. And she weighs about three tons, which you'd think would be a lot of elephant, but a really big elephant can weigh twice as much as that, more than twice as much as that. The biggest mammals that ever lived, about 10 times as much. Imagine that, in Dricotherium, 10 times the size of this critter here. <laughs> oh, that tickles. And the biggest dinosaurs, twice again. 50 tons, Brachiosaurus, so when, you, when you're talking about bigness, this is uh, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. She doesn't have that big an ear either. This is an Asiatic elephant. The big ears come on the African elephants. Still a fairly big ear. She can hear everything I'm saying. Only saying nice things. Now the one thing I'm not sure of here is the color of this dinosaur. Dinosaur modelers love to paint their models with wonderful colors, but you think about the living big animals today. Elephants are kind of gray, rhinos are kind of gray, hippos are kind of gray. It doesn't seem like big animals really need a lot of flashy color. So for my money, 
Uh, nature knows best. I'll bet Stegosaurus was just kind of gray itself. Still a real cutie, but gray. What a cutie indeed. <laughs> some fossil turtles still show some color, but no one expects to find colored dinosaur skin. You know, another fun thing to do, sometimes just go to the zoo by yourself, and that way you can spend more time just watching one particular sort of animal. Get to know individual animals. Monkeys are great for that. These are Japanese macaques. It's a type of monkey, sometimes called snow monkeys. If you watch them, you begin to realize that they have very complicated social behavior and a lot of signals that they give each other. Not, uh, not language like we would use, but little body, uh, body language gestures like a yawn. <sighs> Shows off the canines. That's a threatening gesture. A stare is a threat as well, and they don't like it when we stare at them. They wonder why all of these funny looking primates are threatening them through the mesh. Some of the early studies of primate behavior were done in zoos, and they came to the disturbing conclusion that monkeys were naturally preoccupied with sex. And of course, those studies were supposed to tell us something about the character of our primate ancestry. Hmm, wasn't good news. Turned out they were wrong. Well-adjusted monkeys, they aren't like that at all. It's just that the early zoos had their monkeys in really boring enclosures and the monkeys were bored, so what do you expect? And of course, they have complicated social hierarchies and stuff like that. You get to know these things if you spend a lot of time with a particular sort of animal. I'm not really sketching seriously here either. Just thinking that wouldn't it be interesting if monkeys knew how to make television programs? Ha! Who knows what kind of shows they'd make? Ah, uh, don't say anything. Wouldn't be anything like this. This is sophisticated programming and I hope you appreciate it. Yeah, that's a West African dwarf crocodile. Fully grown, it's not much bigger than a Springer Spaniel. When I go to the zoo, I love to spend time in the reptile house, especially because I think reptiles are perfect zoo animals. So many of them are what we call sit and wait predators. In the wild, they just sit and wait for food to come by, they eat, and they go back to sitting. So they like a nice, comfortable cage, just the right temperature, humidity, the foods to their liking, vitamins, minerals, good light. Ha! Excellent, but there's more to it than that. There's also a conservation angle to most reptile houses these days. There are many species of reptiles and amphibians that are now becoming threatened or endangered, and I have with me now two of those, as well as Sid Andrews, the interpretive program coordinator here. Okay, Sid. Well, We've welcome got, to the uh, Calgary Zoo, John. I'm glad you could be here. And we're in the reptile building with two very, very precious reptiles and amphibians, Dumeril's ground boa, which you've got in your arms, and Puerto Rican crested toad, and they're extraordinarily rare. In fact, so rare that they're in a very, very special program here at the zoo called the Species Survival Plan, and uh, that's because their numbers are greatly at risk out in their natural habitats, and so we have captive populations to try and uh, boost their genetic health as well as their populations. Right. So this is not just your average everyday boa constrictor, this is an entirely different species of boa, isn't it? It is indeed. Now this one comes from Madagascar, or at least its wild cousins do. And of course the problem with um, uh, for this fellow is that a lot of its habitat is disappearing in Madagascar as more and more people uh, try and make a living on Madagascar and they slash and burn to prepare the land for agriculture. And it's meant that they have less habitat and so they really are at risk so they're in the Species Survival Plan which is a computer dating service. And this little toad also is in the Species Survival Plan. Uh, um, <clears throat> they're not matched up. 
not at all. Yeah, these dating services don't always work out, do they? They don't always work, no. He's waiting for a date. Um, she has one here in the reptile building. And believe it or not, these little toads are extraordinarily rare now in Puerto Rico even, because um, they're found only in the southwest, southwest corner of the island where there is a pond that they favor, and in something like four man-made troughs in the northwest. I mean, one pond and four troughs, the cage in the zoo here and a couple others like it? And a number of others in the species survival plan for Puerto Rican crested toads. My goodness. Yeah. Wow. And I can tell by the look in your eye that you're worried that this boa might just reach over and, and uh, endanger that toad even further. It's comfortable in your hand? Well, I'm comfortable. That's good. He seems to be too. Yeah. Yeah. Ka is uh, a fairly docile snake, and he's uh, just shed, so he's nice and shiny, and he's quite comfortable and relaxed in your arm. That's Waiting great. for a date. Waiting for a date. Don't consider this a date. It's just an outing. An outing. There are two types of ground boa in Madagascar, and both are rare and endangered. a lovely autumn morning early one day in the fall i said hey let's go zooing now pack up one and all we got there in a flurry peculiarly dressed we hadn't stopped for breakfast so let's get popcorn it's the best Grandpa had to see the bears Biff prefers the snakes He explained them to Aunt Edna But she's convinced they're fake Katrina got lost in the nocturnal house Her mother looked high and low And Edna was certain the tigers had got her. She told us they're like that, you know. Then Uncle Sid regaled us with tales of jungles deep. His spiritual, personal, mystical bond with the beasts in the zookeeper's keep. Amazing true adventures with the fauna of far off lands. Why he himself had captured a male with only his wits and his own two hands. This is the largest member of its species ever brought back to life. The most aggressive on record, and I might add, the strongest smelling. For me, I like the eagles. The kids had their fun back in time. We all bought matching sweatshirts, then Katrina began to whine. The zoo is fine for Finn to run and camel. So she said, but now she missed her zoo back home on the shelf above her bed. So home we drove exhausted with memories of creatures bizarre. And we never did learn how that African thing got into our family car. You know what my favorite thing is at the zoo? I always love the nocturnal house where they switch day for night. These animals, they think it's nighttime now and they're prowling around under red lights. Behind me is Herbie the Binturong, and I got to meet Herbie the Binturong up close yesterday. I phoned my wife last night and told her I got to meet a Binturong, and she said, that's great. You love Binturongs. Binturongs are your favorite. What's a Binturong? You ever wonder what a Binturong is? Come on around, we'll get to meet Herbie the Binturong. Why, oh, Herbie? Hi, Herbie, come on out. Okay, let me show you a few things I learned from Barb the zookeeper. Here's Herbie the Binturong. And Binturongs, hi, Herbie, how are you? How are you? When you greet a Binturong, you let it smell your head. Smell my head, Herbie. Hey, Herbie. Okay, 
This one doesn't want to smell my head. Herbie, check out my head. See? Yeah, excellent. Guess what I got? Banana. Vinterongs love bananas. They're in the same family as, um, you know, mongoose and civets, things like that. And they live in Asia in forests. They live up in the trees. They have a big prehensile tail for grabbing onto branches that you can't see right now. And they're just so weird. And really nice. Herbie is kind of an older Binturong, about 20 years old, about the same age as me. <laughs> Great big critter too. Uh, the interesting thing about Binturongs as well is that they have a particular odor of their own. Now here at the zoo, they claim that Binturongs smell like taco chips. I've also heard dirty socks and hockey equipment, but my theory is that they smell a lot like some species of ground beetles. Carabid beetles, no offense. Uh, I don't know, those of you who have smelled binturongs and carabid beetles, perhaps you could, uh, you know, give me your opinion on it. I think perhaps Caribus vitinghoffi, a rare ground beetle from Alaska and the Yukon territories. Almost a perfect match. Bent the wrongs, gotta love them. <laughs> oh. The mongoose family in Asia and Africa is comparable to the weasel family in the Americas. You know, in the old days, like when I was a kid, you go to the zoo and you'd see all these really horrible cages and bored animals doing really neurotic things like pacing up and down, rolling their heads from side to side. It was kind of sad. But now things are so much better. I mean, I had a great time here. Saw a lot of healthy, happy looking animals and a group of people, a great group of people who really care about the animals here. It's, it's a whole different world. I like it. I guess that's because I'm a nature nut. And I hope you are too. See you again soon. time each and every week uncensored and uncut no doubt about it i'm a nature nut <laughs>